All right, we're bringing our speaker up to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, if you wouldn't mind, all the way from Boston, Harvard graduate, Dr. Jordan Tischler. He's got a very interesting topic ahead, cannabis medicine taking care beyond the 21st century. Thank you all for coming. It's an honor to be here, and I'm very grateful to uh, make all of your acquaintances. I got asked to talk a little bit about um, how, what we know about cannabis and where we're going to go with cannabis over the next uh, few decades. So let us um, move forward to that. And let's see if this, this... Let me take just a moment to talk, uh, tell you a little bit about myself and where I'm coming from. Uh, my name is Dr. Jordan Tischler. I practice cannabis medicine as a specialty in the Boston area. I went to Harvard Medical School a long, long time ago, uh, trained in internal medicine at a Harvard hospital called the Brigham Women's Hospital. And I spent um, the last 15 or so years working for the VA. Uh, that's um, in the United States. This is the organization that takes care of our veterans. Uh, and I've been a physician in the emergency department there for those 15 years. Over those 15 years, I saw hundreds and hundreds of veterans whose lives have been thoroughly destroyed by drugs and alcohol. Uh, and as a result, sort of really became very, <laughs> unfortunately, well-versed in the treatment of these sorts of addictions and behaviors. In about 2012, when my state, Massachusetts, was considering cannabis as a legal medicine, I started to think, well, geez, you know, this is kind of interesting. I've seen all these guys who, for whom alcohol and various drugs, prescription and non-prescription, have been so dangerous, and yet I've never seen anybody who's been harmed by cannabis. Sure, I'd seen lots of veterans who'd been labeled as having cannabis use disorder, but I'd never actually seen anybody sick. You start to think about that, I start to think, boy, that's pretty profound, and I best learn more about this cannabis stuff. So I spent several years then researching cannabis and coming from a fairly skeptical point of view, now I'm getting killed by the mic, um, emerged to the other side of my uh, learning, very convinced that cannabis is a useful and wonderful medicine. And then I looked around the landscape and I thought to myself, you know, it's funny, I've done all this research and nobody else in my area knows anything about this. And couple that with the fact that all of the major medical institutions of which I was a part, VA and private, all get money from the federal government, tons of it. And as a result, they prohibit everybody from practicing this kind of medicine. So I thought, well, if this stuff is really good for us, I've got to figure out a way to get this knowledge out there and to be able to practice this in a way that brings this to patients, and in particular to the patients of my colleagues in these major medical institutions where their hands are tied. So I opened my own private practice. I certainly never set out to be a private practitioner, but that's been the vehicle to pro provide this kind of uh, work for uh, care for people. And so my practice is called Inhale MD. And, you know, PowerPoint likes to do these animations, so I'm going to have to sit here and click and click and click. I think we all have a pretty good idea of the history of cannabis uh, as a medicine has been around for thousands and thousands of years um, in various guises and used in both medical and, and ritualistic practice. Um, it uh, had not been used in Western medicine for the, the most of that time and really became popularized uh, and, and used in a, in a rigorous fashion only as uh, more recently as the 1840s. But we also know that cannabis uh, was used fairly commonly both in Britain and in France and in the United States as a medicine and had been doing, doing uh, that for quite a long time until it became illegal in 1937. The FDA only, that's in the United States, uh, only became avail uh, involved in 1970, right? At that time, uh, Timothy Leary won a Supreme Court case in which he, they overturned its illegality as an agricultural product 
And so good old dear, uh, Richard Nixon figured out that there was a way to control this as a medicine. And so from since that time, it has been on Schedule 1 in the United States, which basically means that it is um, unacceptable for any medical use. And the United States being um, perhaps the ogre that it is, has then proceeded to force almost every other nation in the world to uh, follow suit using things like financial aid, et cetera, as the lever. One of the things that we see now with politicians is this claim that there's not enough research. It's inarguable that we can always use more research and more research is going on and I'm, the things I find particularly fascinating about this is that the research is going on and it's being done with such rapidity that I spend hundreds of hours per year on reading this literature and quite frankly my practice changes pretty much week to week based on changes in the literature. So don't let anybody fool you that this science is not being done. And presently we have over 26,000 studies in the medical literature on cannabis. And just for comparison's sake, there are about 5,500 studies on alcohol, right? So everybody wants to make this false equivalence that cannabis at best is kind of like alcohol. No, it is not like alcohol. And I'm fond of saying that alcohol is a poison, okay? Alcohol is a product of fermentation. It is yeast poop. And in small doses, we find that this poison may be enjoyable, but it has no real medical value. Its only medical value is to treat alcohol withdrawal, and we have better medicines for that now. The point being is that cannabis, we know, actually is a medicine and actually has reasons for its behaviors, benefits to us in our bodies, and uh, there are reasons for that. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. Um, what I think is particularly interesting is the fact that a 2012 uh, British study tried to look at where medicines and substances should fall on their various controlled substances lists if they actually followed the science rather than the politics. And what really happened was that cannabis just fell to the bottom of that list immediately and that it was below the risks imposed by alcohol and by tobacco both of which, as we know, are freely available. And so it just, the justification for its remaining on Schedule 1 or CAS Class A in Britain just is not there. The point of this study this is really to get to that yeast poop stuff that we were talking about. Our bodies have an endocannabinoid system. This is not true just in humans, it's true in all mammals. The point here is that the endocannabinoid system turns out to be a far-ranging control system, not just in our brains, but throughout our bodies. You've probably heard mention of the two receptors that we know of so far, the CB1 and CB2 receptors. Brilliant creativity in the naming of those. CB1 is primarily represented throughout our nervous system, but not exclusively. It's uh, represented also in other parts of our body in the CB2 receptors receptor, more so in the immune system, but also in some of the supporting neurologic structures like the microglia that Dr. Gordon mentioned earlier. It is part of a very complex uh, pathway that we know controls the homeostasis, the ability of our bodies to maintain proper balance and function. There are both receptor and non-receptor mediated pathways, and without getting into a whole lot of detail that's sort of beyond the scope of our discussion today, the really important thing is this really scary looking slide is what we physicians and scientists use to represent what we know. And what we can tell you here is that we know a lot and that these systems are not isolated. They are very involved in the in inflammatory pathways through this enzymes COX-2 for which there are conventional medications um, and that the receptors are um, uniquely involved uh, throughout our body. It is. Uh, it has been shown that the CB1 receptor at this point is the most uh, widely ranging and highly representative receptor uh, of all. So let us talk briefly about what kinds of things are treated well with cannabis. Obviously pain is a wonderfully well-treated symptom. We can talk about anxiety and depression as being very well controlled with cannabis. Cannabis, in this case, tends to be fairly weak compared to some of the other conventional medications, but this is a wonderful adjunct. People talk about treatment with the SSRIs as being um, elevating the lows 
but also squashing the highs. And really, people come to me and they talk about, I, I feel somewhat better on an SSRI, but quite frankly, it makes me feel a little like a zombie. And adding cannabis on top of that regimen is very effective for re-elevating those highs and getting the pleasure back in life. I sort of glossed over the pain thing, but I got to say pain is the number one presenting complaint for all patients. And it is, as we know, fairly poorly controlled with what we have as options. And I'm going to talk more about that in a few minutes. But the number two presenting complaint is insomnia. And I have to say that cannabis is bar none the best treatment out there compared to the benzos, compared to Ambien, all of those things where people say, look, it either works, it doesn't work, but it leaves me feeling groggy the next day. And cannabis in very, very small doses can be wonderful for helping people get to sleep and stay to sleep with no hangover whatsoever. Obviously, we understand that people who have trouble eating, particularly related to the chemotherapy that they may be getting for various cancer treatments, uh, do very well with a uh, treatment with cannabis. An interesting fact is that people who are underweight tend to gain weight, but people who are overweight do not gain weight. And that these studies show that people who use cannabis on a regular basis on average have a lower BMI than average Americans. So cannabis is your next diet aid? I don't know, but it is an interesting fact. Um, we talked, we, you know, there's nausea and vomiting. Uh, cannabis, or Marinol, anyway, was approved by the FDA in the middle 80s as an attempt to treat people using synthetic THC for nausea and vomiting. Uh, it turned out to be sort of only moderately effective. And worse than that, it seems to be a pill that people take once and then refuse to take again. And this has to do with the fact that unopposed THC is, tends to be a fairly unpleasant experience. But there came out of that, or not came out of it, but going on along with that was this use of regular old cannabis. And it's fairly effective. Um, for most patients, there are conventional medications like Zofran, which are actually more effective. But not everybody responds to Zofran. And sometimes Zofran isn't enough. So cannabis can be a very, very helpful, again, in combination. Um, and then we'll touch more on sexual dysfunction later. But the thing is, and actually we're going to have a panel on this that have four something this afternoon. But the point I want to get at is that sexual dysfunction is a huge issue. It's an underreported issue. People don't want to talk about this sort of thing and they suffer silently. But cannabis is a wonderful treatment in both women and men. And it's something where we as practitioners really have to clue in and be sensitive and be available so that we can treat this. The numbers are staggering. Other illnesses uh, that are well treated, various neurologic diseases like ALS and MS that we know of, um, and in many instances, this is a large area where the whole uh, CBD comes into play as an anti-inflammatory and a neuroprotectant. Autoimmune diseases, again, these are inflammatory illnesses like rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, uh, ulcerative colitis, respond remarkably well to cannabis medicine. Um, I have patients who have been on years and years of various harsh uh, immune suppressants for their Crohn's disease uh, with sort of, you know, moderate... Really? I've gone 15 minutes already? Jeez, I've gotten nowhere. All right, I'm going to have to <laughs> skip, or skip forward here. Bottom line Jeez. is it works. Um, and cancer, we've talked about. I'm going to skip routes of administration and go on to where do we go from here? Current manages, uh, approaches to pain management. Here's a big thing. We only have, not counting cannabis, three classes of agents with which we can treat pain. That's all we've got. We've got Tylenol. That's a, in a class by itself. And for some people, it's moderately effective. Um, I personally find it to be pretty useful. Then again, the other class, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen, right? That's also reasonably effective for some people for some types of things. I personally can't take it. It makes me sick. So people fall into that category. More so than Tylenol, the non-steroidals do have a lot of side effects. They can cause ulcers. They can cause renal disease. And then there's opiates. And we've heard in spades about the opiates, right? Opiates can be addictive. Uh, they cause um, respiratory suppression. And bottom line is they um, cause lots of problems. The biggest problem, however, is the opiates aren't very effective. 
okay? Opiates are great if you have acute pain, if you have surgery, right? The way to treat people's pain is with opiates. But there has been an extension of that, which is if we don't have anything better than opiates, then we're going to use opiates to treat people's chronic pain, their ongoing back pain or whatever pain. And it turns out that it, they're just not very good at it, and there weren't a lot of studies on this for a long time. And now we're starting to get this data, and what we find is they may be the best that we have without counting cannabis, but they're still not very good. And then you bring cannabis into the fold, and what you find is, okay, I'm preaching to a certain choir here, and you realize that everybody's going to want to say, cannabis is awesome. Well, when you put cannabis head-to-head -head with opiates, they're about equal. Neither of them is super great, but they're about equal, okay? But cannabis is so much safer. So if you have two things that are equally efficacious, and one of them is safe and the other one is not, which one are you going to pick? Uh, duh. Opiates are dangerous. Boy, I'm getting ahead of myself. Novel approaches to chemotherapy in cancer. We know that THC and CBD both seem to have anti-tumor uh, efficacy in either petri dishes or mice. Let me take a second to comment and say, petri dishes and mice are not human beings, okay? We have a long, long road ahead of us before we can start to say that this stuff is meaningful for people Okay, but it's very promising. We also know that this isn't the end of the story because certain strains work better than other strains. Not all strains are effective. And so the point is that all of those strains have CBD and THC in them. So why do some of them work and why do they don't? Well, clearly there's other stuff going on, whether that's terpenes or minor cannabinoids. We don't really know just yet. But the point is that research is ongoing and in particular um, in Israel. Must be other factors. Dosing. Dosing feels like the new frontier, oddly enough. It seems to me to be very self-evident that um, we really need to get a handle on how we're using this stuff. As you can see, the point is that you get certain benefit on this curve up to here, and after that, it starts to be not so helpful anymore. And you start to get things like side effects and tolerance and things like that. So what we really need to do is get to the point where we can talk about milligrams delivered, not just bong rips, okay? Novel devices can help us with this sort of thing. I think it's very clear that we um, need to be able to continue to use inhalation, but that we need to de develop delivery devices that allow us to be more precise about what we're getting and how we're getting it. And I think that kind of um, summarizes my thoughts here. I didn't realize I talked so much. That's the one thing about cannabis. You can go on and on and on forever about it. There's so much to talk and so much to learn. We appreciate your help, Dr. Titian. Oh.